All righty. Okay. Sorry. Recording and sharing screens and all those things. Are you ready, Miss Sellers? Well, welcome everyone um, to our final um, Charger Careers sessions on Flex Day. For the students um, who, well, I don't think I know any of the students that are here today. My name is Miss Mulligan, and the reason that we don't know each other is because I am the Alumni Relations um, Director, which means that once our, once you graduate and you go to do the great things that we know that you're going to do, I will be your connection back to CA. And I do fun homecoming and reunions and all of the things to make sure that you stay connected um, and remember that you are a charger. And so once you graduate, we will become good friends. Um, and so we have three alum who are here today to share about their um, experience in different fields in healthcare. Uh, we are thrilled to be able to present these sessions that we unfortunately had to um, cancel career connections this year, but we have really enjoyed being able to connect our alum to our students with the goal, um, and you'll hear a little bit today that when these three alum were at CA, they didn't know what they would be doing um, all of these years later. And we want to make sure that we are communicating and that you understand you don't have to have it all figured out today. There's lots of twists and turns on the road um, to where you will go until you'll get to hear a little bit about that today. Um, so we have three alum. Val Chen is the class of 2005. Um, she works in Charlotte. Um, as a plastic and reconstructive surgeon at Providence Eye and Laser Specialist. And she started there just last year. So she's coming up almost like the one year anniversary. And when she was at CA, she played tennis. And that was one of her favorite places on campus. Um, Jimmy Joyner is the class of 2011. And he is back at um, medical school at South, in South Carolina. He is hoping to graduate in May, 2022. Um, he is studying to be a cardio cardiovascular perfusion, cardiovascular perfusionist. Um, and so he's going to tell us a little bit about how he got there. Before he went back to school, he was in um, clinical exercise psychologist at UNC. Um, and when he was here at CA, his favorite food in the dining hall was chicken tenders. And we, that is still a favorite today. So um, as, must, as much as things change, they also stay the same. And then Julia Neum, who is the class of 2008, she is a physician assistant at Wade Family Medicine. She has been there for um, over three and a half years and Julia really enjoyed um, being at the baseball field when she was here as a student. So they are very familiar with campus and a lot of the experiences that all of you are having right now as students. So we are thrilled to have them here. Um, and we are gonna start with Val and she is gonna share a little bit about her, um, her time. So thank you so much, Val. I will hand it over to you. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, again, my name is Valerie Chen. I am an ophthalmic plastic and reconstructive surgeon, which is a mouthful. Uh, that really just means I did a medical school and then did ophthalmology residency training, doing all types of surgery and care for the eye, and then decided I would avoid the eye and do everything just directly around the eye. So I do plastic and reconstructive surgery for um, the eye socket, the lids. We'll go a little bit more into that. I was on faculty for one year at UNC Chapel Hill, go Tar Heels, where I did undergrad as well. Um, and then I followed my husband out to Charlotte, and I'm currently at Providence Eye and Laser Specialists. Reminder, we're here. So what exactly is it that we do? A lot of folks don't even know that we exist, and that's okay. So one of the most common things I do are droopy lids. Um, and if you hit the button and we have a whole bunch of pictures, our fancy word for that is ptosis. Um, if the eyelid margin is actually dropped down so you can't see that much of the eye or dramatic calasis where you have just a lot of extra skin. So it gives people the appearance of looking really tired. Can it even impact your vision? Um, I take care of eyelids that can roll in or out. And in this next picture, you can see that the gentleman here, his eyelid is rolling in and you can imagine how annoying it is to have a single eyelash in your eye. Imagine a whole eyelid full of them just rubbing on the surface of the eye and the eye gets really irritated and it's difficult to see clearly. I take care of eyelid tumors. This is probably one of my favorite things to do. Um, folks get lumps, bumps around the eyes all the time. Uh, the month of May is actually Melanoma Awareness Month. 
So we take care of skin cancers. A lot of times we do this with the dermatologist, the most surgeons where they'll take out the cancer. Um, they send me a puzzle where there's some sort of defect hole um, and I get to put things back together. I take care of eye socket problems. So this gentleman on your left, uh, he's not just surprised or angry to see you, he has thyroid eye disease and that can cause the eyes to kind of bulge forward and give you that really surprised look. On the, the CT scan that you see on the right, that is an orbital fracture. Um, so probably sustained some sort of trauma and has broken bones around the eyeball. I deal with tear duct issues. Um, I call it simple plumbing. The eye makes tears and drains tears. And here, uh, this young child has a problem uh, with his tear duct. You can see that red bump. He has an infection of that tear duct. We call it dacrocystitis. So I do reconstruction of tear ducts. I build new tear ducts and go into the nose and sinuses. And then I do a lot of trauma. I did my residency in Atlanta at Grady County Hospital. So you, you see a lot of very uh, interesting and scary and terrifying things. Uh, this, I think, was probably a dog bite, and dogs are just, it's tough. They're right at that right size where it, things get stuck in the eyelid, and it tears, and it can take skin, muscle, and the tear duct a lot of the times as well. And then we do a lot more of the cosmetic things with all this, so I do a lot of Botox, filler. I do skin laser resurfacing, so it's a day in the clinic day in the OR every single day just keeps you on your toes. And that's one of the things I love most about what I do. There's no, you know, bread and butter per se. Um, I could literally be doing anything, everything, all these in a single day. And it's just, it's fun. So if we go to the next page, um, how do you get here? It is a little bit of a long road, but it is a good road. I was pretty confident that I was going to do healthcare medicine. I liked it a lot. You know, I wasn't sure what path exactly that was going to take. So again, I was at Cary Academy. I graduated in 2005. I moved to Raleigh when I was a junior in high school. So I just got to kind of do the last two years there. Went to Chapel Hill. You do college for four years. I, I chose to do biology and chemistry because it, it becomes the most natural and almost automatic with a pre-med degree. Then I went to University of Chicago uh, for four years for medical school. And that's where I ran into Ms. Sellers randomly one day on the street. Um, probably one of the best surprises, but you just kind of stop all of us saying, oh my goodness, uh, it's a small, small world out there. Care Academy keeps you well connected. Then you do a one-year internship. Uh, so mine was medicine at Emory University. And then three years of ophthalmology residency also at Emory University. And that's where you do a little bit of everything with the eye specifically. So I was doing cataract surgery, glaucoma, diabetes, retina. And then again, decided eh, I'll leave the eyeball and just do everything around it. And I did additional two-year fellowship um, studying everything we just kind of talked about with eyelids, tear ducts, eye sockets uh, in upstate New York. And so this is what I call the, the good old days back in the day. Uh, I graduated in 2005. We were TSAC champions. Um, and this is, this is our team. We had a lot of really good times, Mr. and Mrs. Morris leading the way there. And so um, I'm happy to have you all contact me, answer any questions you have, but that's my email address. Um, so feel free to reach out. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Julia Nemi. Um, like Kara said, I am a physician assistant, and I currently work at Wade Family Medicine in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Um, <clears throat> it's a federally qualified healthcare center, so we see really everybody. We see people who are insured, uninsured, underinsured, um, so I see a huge range of things. I've been there for three and a half years. Um, I typically do, you know, what, what you all would go see your family medicine provider for. So just, you know, yearly physicals or uh, chronic condition management, so diabetes, high blood pressure. We also do some urgent care. So if you, you know, feel like you have a cold or something like that, typically I see 18 to 22 patients a day, which sounds like a lot, but um, in some days it does feel like a lot, um, but I enjoy it. Um, we also do a lot of community events just because of the type of clinic we are. So like health fairs or um, we assisted recently at like vaccine clinics with everything going on with COVID. We have 
done a mix of telehealth, which has been fun with everything going on, similar to you guys doing virtual school, um, you know, but we still wanted to just be able to provide care for our patients. Um, one of my favorite parts of the job and why I went into family medicine was because I really like that follow up with the patients and really getting to know them and getting to know their families um, and just being able to celebrate small achievements. So if they've been working towards losing weight and they've lost, you know, some weight, I get to celebrate that with them. Or if they're working to get their diabetes under control, I get to celebrate that with them. And I really like that part. The other nice thing with telehealth is sometimes they'll tell me about pets or family members, and then I actually get to see them because of the visits is in their home. So it's just been a really nice way to learn more about my patients over the past year. Um, <clears throat> so I guess for my journey, I graduated Cary Academy in um, 2008. While I was there, I, I wanted to be an athletic trainer and um, was able to do some volunteer work with the athletic trainer, um, Coach Mack, who was there at the time. Uh, and then I went to Elon University for undergraduate. They had just um, gotten rid of their athletic training program before I started. So I went into exercise science thinking that eventually I would get my master's in athletic training. And then I shadowed a bunch of different providers. So I thought, okay, well, maybe I'll be an orthopedic surgeon. Um, but really doing research on what I saw as my 10-year plan and how I wanted to um, you know, have my life. Uh, I felt a physician assistant really fit with what my goals were. So um, once I graduated um, Elon, I had my, um, my major was in exercise science and then I was able to get minors in public health biology in Italian. And the Italian was just for fun and it let me travel to Italy abroad during my time, which was a really amazing experience and something I would recommend if you're able to do traveling abroad in college, even if it has nothing to do with your future plans. Um, I did take some time off in between to um, work as a certified nursing assistant to go to PA school. You are required to have anywhere between 1,000 to 2,000 direct patient contact hours. So I worked as a CNA at just a family medicine practice. Um, other of my classmates were paramedics, EMTs, scribes. So there's a whole bunch of ways to get your hours. And then I went to Campbell University where I did a dual degree program. So I got my master's in public health and then my master's of physician assistant practice. It was condensed into a three-year program. And then once I graduated, I was um, you know, a PA. I accepted my job where I am now before I graduated. Um, and I'm just really, really happy there. I feel like I'm making a difference in people's lives. Um, currently, I'm actually back in school as well, working on my doctorate of health science. So I'll be graduating I think two years from now. So that'll be really exciting. Um, something from Cary Academy that I learned and that's really helped me from where I am was first is I took anatomy with Katie Allen and just really enjoyed that class. And I very much love science. And so that, that was just a really great experience. I learned a lot and I think it really helped me um, throughout my undergrad career as I actually was a teaching assistant in Elon's um, donor lab. And also the big thing I also took from Cary County is just service and giving back and really giving to the community and helping others. Um, it's something I feel I do every day at my job. Um, and it's just something that I've been able to carry with me after my seven years at Cary Academy. And my email address is there. Please feel free to email me with any questions. Thank you so much. Um, and um, Jimmy. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jimmy Joyner. I graduated uh, class 2011 from Cary Academy. Um, <clears throat> and currently I am at the uh, Medical University of South Carolina um, studying to become a cardiovascular perfusionist. Um, and uh, it is not a doctorate degree, it's actually a master's degree. Um, and kind of before we get into the cardiovascular perfusionist and what it is, um, I kind of like to just go into my journey um, kind of academically and what led me to get here. Um, so we can go to that. <clears throat> so like I said, I graduated Cary Academy 2011, um, and then I attended Johnson C. Smith um, University in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and I played basketball there for four years and graduated 2015. Um, and I graduated with a um, bachelor's in sports management with a minor in exercise science. And while being in school and playing basketball, 
I really fell in love with just strength conditioning and, um, you know, going into that and just, you know, doing a lot of workouts and planning. Um, so that was my goal uh, kind of up until my senior year um, at John C. Smith. Um, and it wasn't until I actually brought a friend of mine to a doctor's appointment um, and I didn't want to wait around with him. And I walked around the, the medical facility I was at and I found a gym at the bottom floor. Um, and on the bottom of the you know gym's name, it said uh, cardiac rehab. And so I stepped in there and I asked if anyone could explain to me what that was. And uh, someone said, sure. And they brought me around there and they told me that they told me about cardiac rehab, which cardiac rehab is uh, basically, you know, you think about personal training, but think about it as in terms of for cardiac patients. So if someone had a, an MI, uh, what a myocardial infarction, like a heart attack, um, or they recently got a stent or they had a valve replaced, um, they come to cardiac rehab to, you know, build up their endurance and strength and get back to where they were and create habits to further, um, you know, further their, their life and make them a lot more healthier. Um, so I fell in love with that. From that day on, I fell in love and I decided to go to University of uh, North Carolina at Charlotte for a master's program in kinesiology um, with the concentration of clinical exercise physiology. Um, so in doing that, I learned a lot about, it was, it was kind of like strength conditioning, but more focused on the clinical population. So I learned a lot about cancer, um, pulmonary disease, uh, cardiac diseases, um, special populations, and how to exercise and how exercise affects um, them as well. So I graduated 2017 from there and I began working as a um, exercise physiologist um, at, I think it's now Atrium Health um, in Charlotte. Um, so I worked there for two years and um, I loved it, it was great. Uh, patient interaction. It was amazing to see someone come in who just had a heart attack and is completely scared to do anything. And then you put them on the treadmill and they're able to do 40, 45 minutes, um, really work up a sweat. And you can see that progression and just the joy that they get back in life. And just that, that, that rejuvenation of, you know, I can, I can live and I, and I know how to live. Um, so I did that and um, it kind of led me to where I am now. So I, I loved everything about the, the heart. Um, that was the best part about the job. I learned so much about the heart, um, but I was kind of looking to do more. I always wanted to be in healthcare. My first thought when I was in Cary Academy was to be a doctor, um, but then I slowly realized that that wasn't truly my calling. Um, and so my wife actually, uh, my mother-in-law, she had a client who told her that her son was doing perfusion. And she of course knew I like science and said, well, um, I'm, gonna tell, I'm, gonna tell my, I'm gonna tell my son-in-law about this. So she told me about it. And I of course said, no, it's not something that's for me. Um, and that was a big mistake and I look back on it, um, but I started to research. Um, and look into it and really dive. And I found that it was, it was my calling and it was what I wanted to do and kind of elevate from just cardiac rehab and provide more care for patients. Um, and so that leads me to where I am now. So uh, I'm at the Medical University of South Carolina and this is uh, kind of a setup for a cardiovascular perfusionist. I know it may look like a lot, um, but this is our pump. So what a cardiovascular perfusionist does um, is we provide, we are basically the heart and the lungs during cardiothoracic surgeries. Um, and we provide a bloodless and motionless field for the cardiac surgeon um, to operate. Um, so when you look at this pump, you just, you're gonna see some, I wish I could point, um, but kind of where you see the, the clamps um, the, they have some roller heads. Um, There's some roller heads that help propel the blood. You know, we pull it from the body, so from the venous side, um, and we circulate it through our system, and we also oxygenate it as well 
um, and then we pass it back to the patient. So we pretty much bypass the heart and the lungs, and that way the surgeon is operating. He doesn't have to worry about the heart moving um, and you know there being a lot of blood. Uh, there's a lot that goes into this. Um, I really wish we were together to kind of talk about this more. Um, but you know, we, we do a lot of procedures. You know, we do our basic uh, bypass procedures. You know, if there's a blockage, um, you know, the surgeon will take a, a vein graft and you know connect it from one area and bypass the the blocked area. Um, there's a lot of valve procedures where they'll replace a valve or repair a valve, one of the heart valves. Um, some specialized procedures that are really cool um, are something called like HIPEC is where they'll actually use a smaller circuit similar to this and they'll actually do um, kind of topical chemotherapy um, as well. Uh, we're also involved in robotic surgeries, um, They'll do a lot of robotic surgery, so we'll, our pump will be utilized. Um, but our main goal is to be the heart and the lung. So we um, are gonna provide medications. Um, you know, with us being the heart and the lungs, we also provide support um, from anesthesia. So you know, we'll provide the the anesthetic um, to keep the patient under. Um, you know, we correct blood gases. Um, <laughs> there's a million things that we do. Um, but it's, it's fun and it's amazing and I'm still learning. Um, but you know, I have one more didactic year where I'm in the classroom and doing hands-on stuff as well, but come August, uh, I'll be at my first clinical rotation. Um, so I'll be, uh, pumping cases on a daily basis on my own. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, so this looks like a lot, and I will tell you, it is a lot. <laughs> um, but this is just kind of uh, kind of the schematic of what happens. And I really, I really wish I could use my pointer to kind of uh, show you guys. But if you look at the heart, so kind of where the heart is positioned, you'll see a clamp uh, at the top left of the heart. All right, so we clamp. Um, so that is actually... I can't see because my thing's in the way. So that clamp is actually where we clamp kind of the arterial side. So we'll clamp the aorta and then kind of distal that clamp will actually uh, infuse the arterial blood. So the blood that we've circulated through our system and oxygenated will infuse it back into the patient and it'll go to the brain and you know back to the limbs and, and perfuse the body. Um, and then there's a clamp on the venous side uh, where you know we'll make sure that we get all the blood so it doesn't enter through the uh, right in the right atrium and right ventricle. Um, but as you can see, I mean, if you follow the the picture, you'll see the arrows. It'll go into our reservoir um, from our res excuse me from our reservoir. It'll go through um, a series of um, pumps um, and then it'll be oxygenated uh, through gas exchange and heated or cooled depending on the type of procedure. Um, and then it would be sent back to the patient. Um, but yeah, so it's a, it's a mouthful to talk about with a lot of this. So I might've missed a few things, but one thing I would like to say is um, never stop learning and never stop being uh, curious. Um, I, I loved cardiac rehab. I, I actually saw myself being in cardiac rehab for the rest of my life, but um, it was just looking and learning um, and just asking questions that led me here. I mean, I had never heard of this uh, career path, but never, I, I, I didn't know anyone who did it. Um, and it was just that coincidence, um, which seems to be a common thing in my career choices uh, that, that led me here. And um, just always do your own research before you knock something. Um, you know, you never know if it's truly for you until you actually look into it um, and just continue to learn. And, you know, Care Academy is really a big part of fostering that for me. Um, coming in as a freshman, um, I, you know, that first, first year was all brand new and it took a lot of learning and adjusting to the way um, that things are done at Care Academy, but I'm very appreciative 
uh, of that experience. It really helped me, you know, be the person I am today, uh, kind of be able to question uh, things and be willing to learn things outside of just, you know, what I hear. Um, so yeah, it's a lot. And I provided, you know, my LinkedIn, uh, because it's a lot of information, um, I, you know, I provided, you know, my email, my cell phone, if you want to text me, I can send you uh, like the Perfusion Life website, if you're interested in just looking into it. Um, and when you guys, you know, get to college, honestly, if you find, if you think you're interested in this, hopefully COVID times will be, you know, way past us. And you can actually reach out to a perfusionist. And it's such a small field that they are willing to bring you in and um, there's a lot of, you know, paperwork you got to fill out, but you can actually see, uh, you know, a procedure. And that is what really, really gets you kind of dug deep into it. And you actually learn about other, other jobs as well that happen in the OR, if that's something that uh, you're interested in. But yeah, thank you. That is great. Thank you all so much. Um, and I love that it just shows such a range of options and opportunities in healthcare. And each of you in your own areas probably looked at different specialties as a PA, as an MD, as an exercise field, and Jimmy, your path after that. So thank you. Students, if you wouldn't mind, please, since we've dropped the PowerPoint, if you turn your cameras on, if you're not driving, and we'd love to get your questions. The panelists are, um, we've got about 15 minutes. So please feel free to put into chat if you prefer, or just to unmute and, um, and ask questions. So a lot of you guys mentioned just honing in naturally to a specific focus of what you wanted to do in the vast field of medicine. I was wondering how natural of a process that is, because it seems like some of you got very, very specific. I'm happy to talk about um, more specifically within the kind of direct MD medicine route. Um, so the way medical school is set up, typically it's the first one to two years that is strictly academic. So you're in a classroom taking classes and you're reading about a lot of these things. Then third year of medical school, I like to call it your ice cream taste test. So you'll spend a certain amount of time in each of the major fields. So you'll go through internal medicine, general surgery, uh, family medicine, pediatrics, and then you'll have some time to break out in some of the smaller subspecialties. So for example, ophthalmology is not one of your core rotations. Um, quite frankly, I happen to stumble into ophthalmology and I'm really glad because I think one of the neat things is I always knew I loved working with my hands, I loved operating, but I wanted continuity of care with my patients and I felt general surgery you know, you get a patient come in with appendicitis, you do their appendectomy, and then you probably don't even see them again in post-op, to be very honest. So ophthalmology for me was a really great mix of that. I happen to stumble into ophthalmology specifically, but you will get exposure both um, in the classroom and on clinical rotations with how medical school is set up. And if there are specific fields that you feel like you might be leaning towards that aren't set in your schedule, um, you will have the flexibility to go pursue that. PA school is a little similar where our first year is just straight in the classroom and then our second year is rotations and similar like um, Val was saying is there's certain rotations you do internal medicine family medicine then you get some elective so I specifically chose cardiology and infectious disease which are both just ones that interested me um, but what's a little bit different about being a PA is after your two years of school you're not required to do residency or a um, fellowship. There are options available, um, but you can just go really into any field and then you can change it if you want to. So a lot of my classmates, you know, they went to emergency medicine and said, I'll do these, you know, crazy ER hours for a while. And then if I want to have a family, then I can go to a more set schedule in family medicine. So I chose family medicine because I like that follow-up. Um, I like the schedule, but it was still going to be a pretty broad range of 
things that I would see. Um, I really am passionate about women's health, but didn't want to just focus on women's health right out of school. Um, but that's why um, doing the PA route gives you just a little bit more flexibility, um, but you will still have a, a collaborating or supervising physician um, and you practice kind of what under they do. So my supervising physician is a family medicine doctor, but if she just did women's health, I would only be able to do women's health. And mine have just been a lot more specific uh, with the cardiac rehab um, and the cardiovascular fusion. As far as perfusion goes, uh, a lot of the profession are a lot of students, this is kind of their second career. Um, so they've kind of been in uh, a different uh, career path and then they found out about perfusion. Uh, so we have a lot of nurses, um, we've had teachers, uh, plumbers, um, electricians. Um, so really, you know, anyone um, can kind of get into the field, uh, but a, a lot of it is kind of based off of the, the core of biology and, and chemistry. Um, but again, it's just for me, since mine have been more specific and there wasn't like a, a taste test, um, it's just kind of finding what you love. Sometimes you just, you just know what you like and then there's, you just kind of branch out from that um, one thing that you like, but it still kind of has that base to it. Um, and that's kind of how it's been for me. Thanks for that good question. Who else has got one? So I have a quick question for really anybody. Um, I know some of you mentioned that you could reach out for doctors that are nearby and you could shadow them and just kind of get a feel for the experience. How do you recommend finding doctors that are in your field and are willing or that your field of interest and are willing to allow you to shadow and kind of just get a feel for the career? Um, I would say LinkedIn. Um, that's been something that I've utilized uh, even in school right now. Um, so I reach out, I kind of drafted an email and I'll reach out to perfusionists to build connections. Um, even if it's not right now, I'm not trying to shadow them, but to build connections that may lead to a shadow opportunity. Um, I'm not sure if uh, a lot of physicians are utilizing um, LinkedIn, but I would say LinkedIn or, uh, you know, even just find one that's local to you um, and shoot them an email. Um. I agree with Jimmy. I, I will say that I have a LinkedIn. I, I can't tell you the last time I logged on to my LinkedIn. I'm pretty sure it's up to date and it has me in Charlotte now, but it may not be. Um, talk to people. So, you know, if you're interested in ophthalmology, which you should, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but you're in a different city, reach out to me and I may know people there or talk to your family friends or talk to Ms. Sellers and Ms. Mulligan. Um, I find that that in-person introduction is going to be much stronger. And then just remembered, none of us got here on our own. It takes a village um, and in my case, multiple, multiple villages to get us to where we are. There are a lot of people that helped me on my way. And so most folks are going to be willing. I will say the caveat in all this is COVID has thrown a wrench in everything. And so please don't be offended if they say, hey, yeah, I'd love to have you come, but not now. Um, we don't even allow a lot of family members into our office just to try and protect our patients. But you can at least start to develop a relationship um, either by email or talking on the phone, you even call people's offices. So if you say, hey, there's you know this pediatrics office down the road from me, just call them. And if you just tell the front desk, I'm a student who's interested, is there any way that I could talk to the doctor or learn more? Um, you might get some no's, uh, but I think you'd be surprised uh, that people are, are pretty happy and willing to help out. Yeah, I agree with what both of them said. Um, everybody in the medical field was a student at one point in time and we had to shadow people or do rotations or learn. So we all understand it's hard to do those connections. So I won't say all, but a lot of um, doctors, nurses, PAs, MPs um, are willing to at least talk or point you in the right direction if they're not able to help you. Um, I also know 
just specifically as a PA, we have a, the North Carolina Academy of Physician Assistants, and it's our like um, statewide organization, and they have a lot of resources to learn about being a PA. I'm sure, um, um, the, you know, there's uh, probably one for family physicians in North Carolina. So reaching out to those, some of those resources too, they'll have a list of people that are willing to take students or things like that as well. Thank you guys, that was great. Who else has a question? I have one um, that just in, if I, I'll jump in, but um, others, students, please do, don't let me take over. Um, I'm curious for other specialties. You guys represent a really interesting range. If a student is thinking about, say, nursing, um, or are, are there, can somebody just give a quick sort of um, of the of maybe what other tracks might be available? Um, we've got MD, PA, and exercise uh, kinesiology, and then cardiac perfusionist, but. Uh, is, could someone maybe speak to nursing or and or other kind of pathways there? Yeah, so nursing um, RN um, is, a, is a, so it starts out, it can start as an undergraduate degree. There's also associates in nursing or nursing schools. I'm pretty sure there's actually one in Durham that is a so fully in a nursing school, but Campbell just opened one, which is why I know a little bit about it. It's a four-year degree. You graduate with your registered nurse and your bachelor's of science in nursing and then nurses can just go and do amazing different things um you can get your master's in nursing um and really work anywhere and i will say nurses are the reason healthcare works the way it does we would not be able to do any healthcare if it weren't for nurses so it's a really important field um they can specialize in you know pediatrics or um, really anything. They could also go on to be a CRNA, which basically you're in charge of the anesthesiologist in a um, room someone's doing surgery. So there's a lot of different career paths coming out of nursing. You can be a nurse practitioner, which is similar to a PA, um, but typically it's a four-year degree, and then you can go on to get your master's in nursing, doctorate in nursing. But it's a, it's a much-needed field, especially today, um, and I know that nursing schools are always looking for um, applicants. Thank you, Julia. A message in chat. Um, do you have any advice on how someone who is interested in the health field can find out which career they want to go into? If it I would go ahead, Jimmy. Oh, I was going to say, if it, if it wasn't COVID, I would say the the, the reaching out and you know just going in and shadowing different fields. I actually remember when I was in high school, um, when I was in 10th grade, I had to get my braces again because I lost my retainer. And I had this really good rapport with, um, <laughs> with my orthodontist. And I was like, you know what? I might want to do this. And I asked him one day at a visit, can I come shadow you? And he let me come in for a whole day and shadow him. And that was, he didn't have to do that, but he did that and I thought it was cool, but I learned that, that it wasn't for me. Um, but you know, just that opportunity getting out there, uh, even volunteering, right? Hospital, well, if it wasn't COVID time, but hospitals have volunteering events, right? You know, 5Ks. Volunteering puts you into things and, and lets you uh, kind of experience uh, different opportunities. And that, that's kind of a good way to kind of get a feeler out there. I, I, I laughed because I, I also theory. shadowed my dentist and I, I even took the DAT and then was like, nope, nope, not for me either. Um, I think shadowing is great. I think in the interim um, with the COVID restrictions is just talking to as many people as you can. Um, I think there are a lot more paths in healthcare now than there used to be. So I think before it was more or less not to be so generic, but nurse, doctor. And now with the growing needs in healthcare um, and the increase in knowledge and technology, um, there are all these different fields. And so talking to a lot of different people, their experience, why they chose one versus the other, um, what every single day is like for them. Um, I will say that you 
I don't think anyone loves what they do 100% of the time every single day. It's just unrealistic. But you have to mostly like it most of the time um, because you'll put, especially within healthcare, you'll put a lot of time into your training. Um, it's often some of, you know, the, the best years of your life, so they say. Um, and so you want to make sure that you love what you're doing, or again, mostly like most of the time what you're doing um, to get that point. And it's, it's a really good field. I think you get to give back, um, challenge yourself every single day to be better than you were the day before. So just talk to a lot of people, but it's, I'm glad you guys are all here because it's a great field. Great. Um, Kira, you unmuted. Did you want to say anything? I actually have a question um, for Jimmy. Are you also involved? So I'm assuming at some point in that big picture you sent, you showed us is also if, um, if the patient needs blood, like, are you, you're involved in that process as well? Um, I'm a very active blood donor. And so I just, I'm curious about that. <laughs> yeah. So we are, yeah, we're very involved in that. Um, so uh, in adults and pedi well, adults and pediatrics are gonna be different in adults. Uh, we try not to use blood um, as best as we can. We, we try not to just because um, the research, I mean, if it's, it's kind of, you know, if the patient really needs the blood, of course they're gonna need it, but there's, there's, a, there's a line of do they need it or should we, you know, or do they not need it? Um, but we infuse blood, we, influ we infuse blood products um, to kind of help uh, facilitate, you know, uh, different things that we need. Like if the patient's bleeding, we might give some blood products to kind of stop that. Um, if, you know, the patient's, uh, you know, hematocrit's low, they're, they're anemic, you know, we'll, we'll give some blood. But like for pediatrics, um, we actually will prime our circuit. So the reservoir that you guys see um, we usually use this clear, we call it clear, like plasma light, it's like crystalloid fluid that we kind of make sure we get all of the air out. Um, and then, you know, for like pediatrics, you know, we got kids that are three days to 14, I mean, to, you know, two years to 14 years old. Um, so their circuits are really small. And so we don't want to give like a liter of clear fluid into a small patient because that dilutes their blood. So we actually use donor blood to prime our circuit. And so we'll use, so a lot of the, the, the donated blood will is utilized in like pediatrics. Of course we have it in adult cases, but yeah. Um, so donating blood is, is very essential. Um, there's, a, there's a decrease in, in blood we try not to use it, but we, we want it available. Um, so yeah, we do a lot with blood. That is what we do, blood. <laughs> All things blood. <laughs> Giving blood is a good thing. Um, well, great. Well, just to, uh, we've just got a couple more minutes. So in closing, um, first, of course, want to thank you three so much for being with us today and students for joining too on uh, a busy time of year. But you guys, uh, panelist alums, thank you so much. It's just great to have you back. Um, would each of you just mind a kind of a, a either a final parting advice for the students and or something you wish that had been said that hasn't been said in terms of either connecting the dots from CA forward or anything to share as they look ahead? And uh, whoever wants to go first would be great. Gosh, no pressure, right? Uh, Pardon words. Uh, find something you like to do, work really hard at it. Don't forget to keep some work-life balance in the midst of that, because if you don't care take care of yourself, you will never be able to take care of anyone else, whether that's your family or your patients. And then I would say at the end of the day, don't be afraid to fail. Um, because it means that you are growing and you learn far more from your failures than you do your successes. And I think sometimes um, with how competitive and how stressful this can be, sometimes we get so focused on just acing every class, getting fives on your APs. And I mean, I, schools do look at that to some extent, but it's you're more than just these numbers. So don't be afraid. Um. 
you know, obviously all of us love science or we wouldn't have gone into these fields, but try to make sure you enjoy, you know, your time and don't just focus on, okay, I need to take this class, find, you know, activities you enjoy. Um, like I mentioned earlier, studying abroad was obviously nothing to do with my career path, but I, it was such an amazing experience. So make sure you're focusing on, you know, your ultimate goal and it's okay if that goal changes, but also learn and take classes you wouldn't necessarily take and just really enjoy your time to absorb as much as you can when you're in high school, when you're in college. Um, keep an open mind uh, and, you know, don't fall into the, the, the standard kind of, it has to be, I have to, go to college and uh, after college, you know, I have to, there's no, there's no standard path for anyone. Um, everyone's path is going to be different and, you know, just find your path and what you love and what you'd like to do um, and, and, you know, work hard and however that path is to get to that goal, you know, don't, don't quit. You know, it, like Val said, you know, it, failing uh, is something that's going to happen but it's, it's how you bounce back and learn from those failures is going to speak volumes into, you know, how you grow as an individual, as a professional. Thank you guys so much. Um, Ms. Mulligan, anything else before we wrap up? Awesome. All right, students, thank you guys for joining. Panelists, thanks so much for being here. Everyone have a great rest of the day. Awesome. Thank you guys. Thanks, Julia. Oh, everybody just left. All right. Cool. Hold on. All right. Okay. Woohoo. It's a wrap. <laughs> they did good parting advice, and I have to say,